preacher, Al Potter, forward. Thank you, Al. Thank you. Please, be seated. Good morning. Good morning. So, I was a small boy. I lived in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. It was not a big, teeny, large city uh, outside of Washington that it is today. It was, it had more of a small town flavor, a little sleepy with a southern feel. And Alexandria had this terrific parade on George Washington's birthday. I'm talking floats and marching bands, the whole thing. And you can imagine as a kid, I used to love to go. But there was a problem. I oftentimes couldn't see the parade because there were a lot of people there. And I was little. So my dad would sometimes put me up on his shoulders so I could get a better view. Maybe that's one reason why I've always kind of related to the story of Zacchaeus, who we heard about in today's gospel that Tim just read. Zacchaeus was interested in seeing Jesus as he passed through Jericho on his way to Jerusalem. Now this was late in Jesus' ministry. In fact, the reason for the trip to Jerusalem was that Jesus had already told the apostles that he had to go there in order to fulfill the prophecy of his crucifixion and resurrection. Jesus had been out curing sick people, teaching, telling parables, creating miracles, generally creating quite a stir. So the word on Jesus was out, and Zacchaeus was very curious, and he wanted to see him. So as we heard in the Gospel reading, Zacchaeus ran ahead to get to a tree that was on the route that Jesus was taking. He climbed up in that tree. And then when Jesus came to the spot where Zacchaeus was in the tree, this remarkable thing happened. Jesus stopped and looked up in the tree and called to Zacchaeus by name and said, Zacchaeus, come down, for I must have dinner with you at your house tonight. Well, that was, must have been pretty exciting, but for a lot of the onlookers in Jericho, it was cause for them to grumble that here was Jesus again associating with a person that they saw as a sinner, or at least somebody who was on the fringes of the mainstream of society. Zacchaeus would not have been one of the better liked people in Jericho. In fact, he probably was about as well liked as somebody selling Yankees hats at Fenway Park. <laughs> but Jesus had a habit of associating with people that caused people to grumble. So Zacchaeus was not well liked, and he was short of stature. He probably didn't have very high self-esteem. But instead of seeing a disliked tax collector, Jesus saw a man who was thirsty to come to know him and to know God and to deepen his faith relationship. So I'm kind of intrigued by this notion of Zacchaeus being in a tree kind of out on a limb, so to speak. I like the metaphor nature of it. I mean, sure as Zacchaeus went to the tree to get a better viewing spot so he could see Jesus, but like kind of like I did on my dad's shoulders for a parade. But I suspect there's another reason why Zacchaeus was in that tree. I think Zacchaeus felt safe in that tree. He could watch the entourage see the going on, see Jesus coming, but he didn't have to commit. He didn't have to be in the parade. He didn't have to confront Jesus. Well, avoided did that change when Jesus called him down out of the tree and said, I'm coming to your house for dinner. So the gospel reading that we heard is a little short on details when it comes to what happened at that dinner at that time. We don't know what was on the menu, and we don't know exactly what the conversation was. But one thing is for sure, Zacchaeus made a significant faith-based stewardship commitment. He pledged
pledged to give half of his resources, and as we've heard, he was a wealthy man, to the poor. Zacchaeus is sometimes referred to as the patron saint of stewardship. Now we know of stewardship as a lifelong journey and a year-long commitment between ourselves and, and God and, and our church. And we know it involves time and talent as well as treasure. But let's make no mistake, this commitment that Zacchaeus made that day was all about money. Zacchaeus didn't pledge to go be a teacher at the Sabbath school or to usher at the synagogue. I mean, those are nice, important ministries, but they're left for another discussion. Zacchaeus made a faith-based commitment of a significant portion of his resources for God's work with the poor. Simply stated, Zacchaeus reordered his financial priorities. Now relax. I'm not going to suggest that we all give 50% of our possessions to St. Luke's. Although I suspect there are a few people on the vestry who would think that that makes their job pretty easy when it comes to budget time next year. But I do think that we can acknowledge that, as Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. You notice he didn't say it the other way around. Jesus invites us to consider that as we make a deeper financial commitment to our relationship with God, that we will deepen our overall faith and relationship with God. The other reason I can relate to Zacchaeus is that he's different from a lot of the people that Jesus engages with in his ministry. You notice that Jesus doesn't ask Zacchaeus to drop his work and to follow him as an apostle. And Zacchaeus is not blind or a leper or sick or seeking a cure from Jesus as so many of the people were who approached him during his, his life. In fact, Luke portrays Zacchaeus pretty much like a regular doctor, like one of us. Zacchaeus is caught up in the frenzy of the ministry of Jesus. He's excited about what he sees, and he wants to be a part of it. But he's hesitant. He's afraid at first to commit. He's in a tree and not anxious to jump into the parade until he makes that significant and faithful commitment. Another thing that is interesting about Zacchaeus is that after he makes that faith-based stewardship pledge, it appears that he goes back to his normal life and work. We don't hear Jesus say, go and collect taxes no more. But don't you think that Zacchaeus' life was changed forever by that encounter? Don't you think that the next morning when Zacchaeus woke up, he felt better about himself? about his relationship with his neighbors and his relationship with God. Jesus' benediction that day was salvation has found this house. One of the historians I read translated the word salvation as the wholeness that found the peace that day. So, Another reason I've always kind of related to this story about Zacchaeus is that I was definitely in the tree when it came to this notion of stewardship. Several, and by the way, I think my wife Linda was right up in that tree with me. A number of years ago, before we moved to Rhode Island, we lived in Maryland, and we went to the Episcopal Church there. In fact, I was on the vestry. 
And our daughter, our seven-year-old daughter at the time, was in the church school. And we pledged to the church. I don't remember what it was. Frankly, the fact that I don't remember it is because it was probably pretty insignificant. It was just enough we felt to be respectable and do the right thing as a part of the parish community. But we were definitely in a tree and not a part of the parade when it came to our faith-based commitment on a financial way with God and with our church. Then one day I, I went to this workshop at the church on stewardship. Now this was, please, this was not about giving and it wasn't about pledging and it wasn't about fundraising. It was about how stewardship can be an important part of our lives as Episcopalians. I learned about this notion of the scriptural basis and the tradition in our faith for tithing, or giving 10% of our income to God's work, including the church. And that was a pretty daunting notion for us at the time. And I can assure you we were a long way from a 10% commitment to the church we were attending. But then we started to look at that standard through the lens of our Episcopal-based tradition of looking at things through the three-legged stool of scripture, tradition, and reason. And as Linda and I thought about the many gifts that we had received from God, through no earning of our own, mind you, a comfortable house, loving parents, good education, job opportunities that had come our way, suddenly this notion of committing 10% of what we receive through God's blessings to us seemed a lot more reasonable. So we made the commitment back then to try to get to that level. It was a little uncomfortable at first, but over time it became a joy. We took baby steps at first, and then we planned it out over a multiple year process. And every fall, when it came time for the stewardship commitment time at our church, when we sat down and made our stewardship commitment for the upcoming year, we would celebrate because we were happy with the commitment that we had made. And much as I think Zacchaeus probably felt, the morning after he had that encounter with Jesus, we felt good about the fact that as we made financial commitments to our faith, we felt better about our relationship with God and our understanding of how we related with our church. So, ever since then, I felt kind of a special kinship with Zacchaeus. But, please understand, it doesn't get easy. Every year this time, when we consider our stewardship commitment to God's work, we need to call ourselves out of the tree all over again. So, as I think about the story of Zacchaeus, I have some other questions. I mean, it's a pretty short gospel, and I want to know more. I want to know, did Zacchaeus want Jesus to see him in the tree, or not? I want to know how Jesus knew that Zacchaeus was in the tree in the first place. Do you think somebody tipped him off? Can't you hear it? Hey, Jesus, there's a wealthy tax collector named Zacchaeus in the sycamore tree around the bend. And what about Zacchaeus' life after this encounter? I wonder how it changed. But as interesting as those questions are to me, I think that we individually and collectively have a much more important and difficult question to ask ourselves. We need to ask ourselves that question as we consider with gratitude the many gifts that we've received from God, 
individually and then corporately in this church home at St. Louis. And we need to ask ourselves that question as we consider the many financial needs that we have at St. Luke's in order to fulfill the vision that we have set out at St. Luke's for the work that we want to do and God's work in this place. So as we consider that question, we need to think about the sign that's in the atrium that says it's not just business, it's personal. So for us, that question is personal between ourselves and the person that looked back at us in that card that we got in the mail a few weeks ago. For us, that question is personal between us and Jesus as Jesus calls us out of our respective trees. For us, that question is personal between us and God. And that question is, how will we respond? 